Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this Friday edition. It is certainly good to be here with you all this day. Now, t- tonight's broadcast may be cut a bit short, and um, there's some scheduled maintenance that needs to be done, and um, a few other things. So it may be cut short, but we're in the Book of Acts. Tonight we're going to do the a slight introduction to the Book of Acts. If you guys want to go ahead and get your you know, placement with the book of Acts and get some uh, notes together, that'll be awesome. Now, this is a collective study, which means I'm not the authority of this word. Our Father is. It's already been established, already happened. Okay, it's already happened. We're just going to go in and be a bit nosy and begin to learn from the apostles and from our Christ a few things. Also, the book of Acts was following the time of Christ. We had to remember that. Um, this is when Christ had spent some time with them, an additional time with them. And so we're, we're, when we go into chapter 1, possibly going into um, parts of chapter 2, possibly, we're going to be picking out some things. Now, one of the attitudes that the disciples had, that they had was, they followed Christ, they believed in Christ, but they also experienced his death. Can you imagine how crushing that would be to experience his death, his crucifixion? That would cause utter confusion, because if you remember in the New Testament, they often did not know what Jesus was speaking of when he said he had to be delivered up, and this, that, and the other. They didn't know exactly what he was saying. So when he was crucified... You can see there was a type of anguish. Now imagine yourselves having seen the miracles of Christ, having seen the dead being raised again, and yet man has the power to destroy the very thing that held promise in your life. Understand that process. The very thing that has promise in your life, they saw that very thing, Christ, who had promise in their life, who they had followed and saw and beheld, was killed by mankind. Can you imagine the struggle in that? Can you imagine what our Lord went through in that? And so in the book of Acts, this is when <clears throat> they were they were totally out of sorts. You can imagine that today by having your hopes dashed, right? Many people go through that day after day, time after time. The hopes are dashed, and it, it's completely devastating. So when we read the book of Acts, starting in the first chapter, remember what they went through and what their, what their uh, mindset was, having experienced the death of their Savior. Now, it begins in the book of Acts, chapter 1. You guys there yet? You guys with me? Are you guys with me? Chapter 1. Mm, chapter 1. It reads, the former, this is chapter 1 of Acts, just in case you're not there. The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach until the day in which he was taken up. After that, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So then, even after his crucifixion, he came back to them, showing them, demonstrating to them, proving to them. Did you hear that? Did you hear that? Verse 3, To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs. Many infallible proofs. That means he demonstrated to them, yes. I am the same Christ, which tells you what, they they couldn't believe it, they were beside themselves, they couldn't believe that was Christ, and so that's why he had to do things, right? He did things. It reads in verse 4, And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which, saith he, ye have heard of me. For John, John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost, not many days hence. It is an amazing thing that God will often give a command, give a directive. Have you obey before you receive anything of him? Have you noticed? 
He told us to be patient. He told us to, we were instructed to be very patient, to wait upon the Lord and renew our strength. There's always an instruction prior to deliverance. Always. And that is so, but listen, here's the deal. Why would he give instruction prior to giving you something? Because God is a God of obedient children, that's why. Now, how do you get one to be obedient that you may bless them? How do you do that? You tell them to wait. Wait upon you. And if they do so, each moment they wait, they are obedient, aren't they? If the Lord told you to wait for something in your life, each day you wait for that thing in your life, you're being obedient. That's what's happening. The moment you don't wait, you're disobedient. It's that cut dry. It's, it's very simple. That's very simple. Many people don't know that because the, the children of disobedience, the prince of the air works through them. So they walk in a type of error. If you are obedient, you're blessed. Adam and Eve, so long as they did not touch the tree of good and evil, because God said, don't touch that tree, don't eat of it either. So long as they didn't do that, what were they? They were blessed. Why? Because they were obedient. The entire time, they didn't touch it. They were obedient. How easy and simple is that? Isn't that simple? Now, the world does not see it that way. The world will give you a task, right? And then after you complete the task, they say you were obedient. God doesn't work that way. He doesn't. Let me explain this a little better because somebody needs to get this. In the garden, God told them not to eat of the tree of good and evil. For in the day they do, they will surely die. So long as they didn't touch that tree, they were children of obedience. They were children of God automatically because they were obedient to him. They became disobedient not because they heard from the serpent, not because they interacted with the serpent, because they were no longer obedient to God. That's why. They were no longer obedient to God. Right? That was it. So long as they didn't do those things the Lord had required, they were obedient and everything else was left open, wasn't it? Hmm? In our lives, in our lives, the Lord will he, he'll give us a task before he bestows something upon us because he will not bestow something upon a child of disobedience. Do they have grace and mercy? Yes. Do they have blessings upon their lives? Well, it's a different matter. Right? The prince of the air works in the children of disobedience. Jesus told them, do not leave Jerusalem. Don't depart out of Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father. That's what he told them. Hmm? That's Somebody says, was there an Adam? Was there an Adam? I would say, yes, there was an Adam. Some people say Adamo. Adam means human or man. That's what it means, human or man. Right? Verse 5, For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. So he's telling them to wait. Telling them to wait. Until the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Right? When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? This is very important, because we have that same question. Don't we? We have that same question. So Jesus tells them to wait and do not depart out of Jerusalem. Right? But wait for the promise of the Father. That's what he tells them. He told them what they were going to get. And what did they ask? He says in verse 5, Jesus is saying this, For God truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days since. That's what he says. So what do they say in their infinite wisdom? Right? They say, when they, therefore, when they therefore came together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? They were worried about the... Now listen, you have to put yourself in their shoes. 
their Savior was killed by mankind. Then the Savior came back, and he proved that he, yes, he is the Savior. He is the Christ, being with them 40 days. He gives them instruction. Their courage and everything else is built back up. They say, yes, we've got them back again, and it's supernaturally. No one can kill them, right? So naturally, they went a step further. Are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Right? Because that is the final step of all things. That is the end of the matter. That is the end of the matter. So they thought this. And what does Jesus say? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. Right? In his own power. He put that in his own power. He's so loving in the statement, but I want you to see what they're looking at because we all do the same things. One of the number one questions that we ask ourselves is this. When is the Lord coming back? You may not directly ask that question, right? But we are so preoccupied with when Jesus is coming back that sometimes we get stalled. And the reasoning for us being here is lost, right? Jesus tells them it's not for them to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. So that means the restoration of Israel, God put in his power, and it's not for the disciples to know the times or the seasons of it. That's powerful. Because do you not know how many times people say, hey, I know when that kingdom is going to be restored. No, you don't. If the disciples didn't know, you, you won't know either. Unless you're alive to see it. Right? So he says, it's not for you to know. Not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. You know, that halted a lot of my searches in life. I did. That just halted so many searches. It, it just made me, well, you know, there were just so many things I no longer cared about. Really. Because when Jesus says something, right? You have to understand this. You, you, you have to understand this. When Jesus states something... Right? He states a truth. He states a truth. And you have to know the power that was given to Christ in the first place. How many of you truly understand that most people don't understand the power Jesus was given in the first place? And so this is why I listen to what he says. And one good example of that is John, I believe it's uh, John chapter 5, if I'm not mistaken. Let me go find it. Can I go find it? John 5. Yeah, here it is. You guys ready for this? <clears throat> John chapter 5. I'm going to start in uh, 20. All right, can I do that? For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that himself doth. And he will show him greater works than these, that ye may marvel. For as the Father raiseth up the dead, and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. All right? As the Father raiseth up the dead and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. For the Father judgeth no man. Let me read that again. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. Who is the judge? Jesus of Nazareth, the same one so many deny. Let's continue to read. That all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son honoreth not the Father, which hath sent him. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given the Son to have life in himself, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. That is very important. He just told us why he gave Christ authority. He didn't say because he's the son of God in this context in verse 27. He said because he is the son of man before he said the son of God. Right? How many of you caught that the first time? God has given...
Christ's authority to execute judgment also because he is a son of man. What does that mean? Because he was human, just like us. So what does that mean? Here's what it means. God understands your sufferings. That's what it means. He absolutely, 100%, understands your sufferings. In fact, can I prove it to you? People always want proof, don't they? So let me prove it to them. By scripture. Can we do that by scripture? That's the best way to do it anyway. Let me find something in scripture. Are you guys ready for this? Right? Hebrews chapter 4, 15. For we have not an high priest, which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Hmm? Then it says, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. Why? Because of all the people on the face of this earth, Jesus suffered. He was afflicted. He was spat upon. He was alone. He knows what loneliness is. He knows what despair is. He knows what great fear is. Everything we could possibly go through, Jesus is highly aware and is very sympathetic to our slightest, to our slightest shifts in feeling, spirit, and other things. We don't have a high priest, right? Which is not touched, did you hear it? For Listen, Hebrews 4, 15, for we have not, we don't have a high priest which can't be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. That means he is touched by your pain, by your sufferings, by your loneliness. Did you know that? He's not ignoring you. He is touched by them. He suffered what you suffer and more. He suffered to a greater extent than all of us so that when you suffer, he's very sympathetic to your sufferings. I know it's not taught too much, but he is. He really is. There are also some other scriptures implying things about when we suffer. And we're going to learn about that. Let's go back to the book of Acts. Are you guys still with me? You awake? You awake now? Most people don't believe that. So number one, what do we establish here? What do we establish here? A command came telling them to wait. When you wait, and do so by order of Christ, you are obedient. Right? You are obedient. Jesus told them not to go outside of Jerusalem until the promise came. They were looking for higher things. Jesus was not talking about that. Now, in verse 7 of Acts, it says this, chapter 1. And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Did you hear what he said? Why did he say this right after? Jesus, his teachings are just above our little minds sometimes. In verse 7 he says, It is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. He says, But, there's a clause, But you shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And you shall be a witness unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria unto the uttermost parts of the earth. God has placed times and seasons in his own power after his own call. Listen to me. Why would that word power be used in two separate verses that just simply don't relate to one another? Why would Jesus even do that? Because he was talking about the word power, wasn't he? They just introduced... A lesson for themselves that we should also capture now if the father if it is not for us to know the times or seasons that's what most people will focus on 
but they're missing the greater point. He said, it's not for us to know the times or seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. Now, he emphasizes this word power, because he begins the next verse by saying the next sentence, but ye shall receive power. Did you hear that? So wouldn't it pay us to understand, but well, wait a minute, what, what power is being defined here? What power is being defined here? You see, I'll tell you this, many people, they believe in the Holy Spirit, don't they? Many do. They believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is real. But they don't see a separation between having the Holy Spirit work in your life and receiving the power of the Holy Spirit. Two different things. You're going to find that out in the book of Acts. In fact, in the Bible, it's the Holy Spirit that has been working through humanity, that even worked through us before we were saved. And all that's going to be clarified, even before we were saved, to call us to Christ. It's been the Holy Spirit working on our behalf in the first place. But the power of the Holy Spirit is different. Now, he told them, don't you go out of Jerusalem until you receive the power. Didn't he? Until you receive that promise, don't go out of Jerusalem. Why? Because when they receive the power, listen, verse 8, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. So then, he says, then you will be witnesses. When? After the Holy Ghost comes, after the power of the Holy Spirit comes, after they receive power, they'll be witnesses. What is that called? Because the Lord said signs and wonders follow them. That believe, that, that will preach his word. Signs and wonders are going to follow them. <clears throat> Even the disciples said the same thing. Jesus told us things, and it's a huge disconnect in this day and age. It really is. Now, I don't know about you, but I believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. I know the power of the Holy Spirit is real. I know the Holy Spirit is real, just like I know my Lord and Savior is real, and the Father who sent him is real. Many people begin to justify why the power of the Holy Spirit is not working through them in what they do. Well, see, you have to examine two things. If the Lord has sent you to do something, he's also empowered you to do something. <clears throat> Hasn't he? Why would he send you to do something not being equipped? He told his disciples, don't you take anything. You just go out there and tell the gospel. And then when they got back, he said, well, I sent you out there with nothing. Did you lack anything? They said, no. <clears throat> you see, so if he sends you, if he commands you to do something, he has empowered you to do it. He empowers you to do it. Right? From the garden all the way up until this time, if he assigns you to do something, he has empowered you to do it. But the disconnect is this. We have a bad habit of, of becoming confused because we begin to, in a way, deify the words of men and not the voice of the Lord, which were in his writings. We begin to listen to the ideologies of men and not the Lord. Lord knows I've done this a thousand times. You, do you not know <clears throat> that uh, I was one of those people, and I said, wait a minute, the Holy Spirit is real. I, I automatically knew Christ was real, the Holy Spirit was real, the power of the Holy Spirit was real. I was just hard-headed, and I didn't do anything I knew, I, I knew not to do. All, the, all those things I've ever done in my life, I did nothing by accident. I knew exactly what I was doing. I'm telling you, it's premeditated sin. I knew to stand still in a lot of cases, and I didn't. But see, you try to rationalize your own fate in a lot of cases. How many have done that? In other words, when you're trying to do something right by the word, and things get worse, you try to rationalize, well, maybe I deserve it. That's what you start saying. Well, just, just maybe, the, you know, I did something I don't know about, and it's coming back. All that is hogwash. Because the word is true. Not our preconceived notions not the ability to rationalize the situation as best we can based upon the context of our human minds earthly minds it can only go so far and thus what do we do if the Lord right now told us by the Holy Spirit to wait and do nothing for 15 days hardly any of us, any of us would wait 
You know what we do? After everybody else is going out there doing their thing in the summertime, guess what we would say? Well, maybe that wasn't the Lord. That's what we say. Well, maybe that was, maybe I was just talking to myself or something like that. And so we suffer from what? Identifying. Identifying the Lord, even in his come, even in his speech, the leading of the Holy Spirit, we suffer to identify. If it's not in our favor, guess what we do? We start making up all this, well, maybe that wasn't the Lord, and maybe that was just me. That's what we do. How does that happen? How does that happen? And I'm trying to tell you in the book of Acts, do you don't think they felt this? They began to admit some things later on in the Acts of the Apostles. Because they said, well, maybe we made a mistake. Well, maybe we thought one thing and it turned out to be another. Who set them straight? The Lord did. He set them straight. So in this instance, in reading what we read, we have to, we have to slow down and accept the truth, not debate it. How can truth be debated? It can't. Truth is truth. Truth can never be debated. It really can't. Truth existed in the beginning. It exists now. It will exist long after everything is gone. Truth is, it was, and it will be. That sounds familiar. Anyway, truth. Truth is stationary. Truth can't be truth if it changes. So truth is a constant. And if we had that constant, we wouldn't be so shifty. Well, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, didn't he? Right? But what happens is we are the ones who are shifty. Because we look to something to believe. Never staying focused on believing on the name of Christ. That's going to be defined too. How do you believe upon his name? That's going to be defined. So, verse 9. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up. And a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they... Be, what, now, he was taken up out of their sight while they were looking. Verse 10. And while they looked steadfastly toward the heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, You men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into the heavens? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in a like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. That's beautiful. Isn't that beautiful? Because it always states he is coming with the clouds and with power and great glory. They beheld him go up into the heavens. Right? He went up into the heavens and a cloud received him. He went up into the heavens and a cloud received him out of their sight. Acts 1.9 He's coming back the same way. Right? You know how many people I've heard. Now, it states it right here, but I've heard people say, well, the cloud represents fuzzy thinking. I've heard so many things you wouldn't believe it because they're trying to rationalize what they would call supernatural. I'll tell you this. Whatever is supernatural in the Bible should be natural to us. It should only be supernatural to those who are not yet kingdom dwellers. It, really, it shouldn't be supernatural to us. It should be common to us. right? It should be the truth of how things work, not supernatural. Right? Verse 11, verse 11, or verse 12. Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they were come in, they went up into the upper room, where abode both Peter and James and John, Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon, Zealots, and Judas, the brother of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. With whose brethren? Did you hear that? These all continue with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. You know how many people I have heard say, See, I told you Jesus had brothers. Oh yeah, don't you read the scriptures? He said, Anybody who believes upon his name is his mother, sister, brother, I'm adding cousin, whatever you want to call it, their family. Their family. Hmm? Part of being new in that calling is a name change. 
right? The world called you by an old name. Jesus surnamed them, didn't he? I love that. Gave them a new name while they were on earth. I do, I like that. These all continue with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women, Mary the mother of Jesus, and with the brethren. And in those days Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, The number of the names together were about 120. Men and brethren, the scripture, pay attention guys, the scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas which was, which was, guide to them that took Jesus. The scriptures were fulfilled, Judas' prophecy. For he was numbered with us and had obtained part of his ministry. Now this man purchased a field with a reward of iniquity. Falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst, and all his bowels gushed out. And it was known unto all dwellers at Jerusalem, insomuch that the field is called in the proper tongue, the Seldomah, that is to say, the field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, Let his habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein, and his bishop brick, let another take. I'm going to stop right there, because in the psalm, prior to reading this, how many people would even have a, a smidget of an idea that this was referring to Judas? and that it was a prophecy. How many people even knew that this was prophecy in the book of Psalms in the first place? Many people don't, because of the interpretation of Psalms. Right? They didn't know that. Well, there are some other prophecies that have been fulfilled in the time of Christ that will just simply blow you away. I mean, they will blow you away. It will also let you know, uh-oh, we are in the last days. That's what it's going to let you know. Let's continue to read. Wherefore of these men which have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from baptism of John unto the same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. And they appointed two, Joseph called Marsabas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed, and said, Thou, Lord, which knoweth the hearts of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen. That it may take part of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell. That he might go to his own place. And they gave their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. How many people knew that that happened? Now, let's, let's go ahead and give you this. Did you see the character of Judas? And do you know what Judas relates to? Right? Verse 18. Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity. And falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst, and all his bowels gushed out. The same field he purchased with what he obtained for turning over Christ is the same field that took his life. Often in prophecy you read, you read, that the very things that the rich have gotten based upon the oppression of others will be the very thing that destroys them. You read that quite often. Hmm? How many of us, how many of us have profited from Christ? Uh-oh. How many of us? See, don't you want to know what's wrong in my life? How can I clean it up? This is why on Sundays, I'm going to use myself as an example. I can't use you. I have to use me. I'm going to give you ammunition. So much ammunition, you can't carry it. But I'm going to use myself as an example. Right? How many times have we profited from our Lord's work and from his words and from following him? How many times did we learn his words simply to stand out? How many times... Did we truly profit from knowing his word? Did we not find favor with others based upon our knowledge in his word? Didn't we? Didn't we attract attention based upon our knowledge of his word? Didn't we attempt to fit in based upon the knowledge of his word? Was our motive pure? How can it be pure if we profited? How can it be pure if we had our minds set on belonging? 
Hmm? You guys see that? I know the devil doesn't uh, you really like that type of speech. Because all of a sudden the flesh will start saying, well, it's not that. Now, God wants you to have everything. No, you need to go back to Philippians and, and read about suffering. And read about the reward of Balaam. And read about betrayal. How that we do it ourselves all the time. Have I betrayed Christ in my life? Yes. Have I denied Christ in my life? Yes. Did I do it by word? No. I did it by many other means. And you know what the saddest part is? I acted like I didn't know I did it. I downplayed it. Didn't I? To deny Christ. Many people say, I would never deny Christ. You just did by saying you would never deny Christ. And the reason why is this. Jesus said by his power, we're going to finish this race, not by ours. Right? Right? If you are saying within your own power, you're never going to deny Christ, you messed up already. That means you're operating on your own. You're trying to carry Christ. And you can't do that. It is not by your power you're going to make it in the first place. I can't carry Christ. There's no way in the world. That's where these folks like Jim Jones and all these people come up. Why? Because they carried Christ. And guess what they did? They carried Christ and they maintained it in front of people. And then the people thought they were Christ. And they smiled. Yes, I have authority to interpret God's word. That's a sign of Lucifer himself. You have authority to interpret his word. I'm sorry. I thought the Holy Spirit gave us revelation. That was the absolute truth. And if he gives 20,000 brothers a truth, they're going to have the same truth. No. You see how mankind, what they're doing is, they are rewarding themselves from what? Iniquity. Selling Christ Jesus. They're selling him. Just like Judas did. That's called betrayal. They sold him for materialistic things sold him have we ever sold Christ huh some of us have gotten close sold him. see sometimes we go through life and we're like well, 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 what's going on and this that's where it's good to have a, a, a reboot a kick start say wait a minute let me get all this straight because I can't live like this anymore the truth is we have lived our way for many years and we're still unsatisfied. Do you know that's not so with Christ? There is satisfaction in Christ Jesus. But there is no satisfaction in the world. So guess what? What does that reveal? See, it's time we can't excuse ourselves and say, well, you know, every... No, stop saying that. Stop excusing yourself. If it does not come out the way that Jesus has ordained it and proclaimed it, something is wrong with it, period. And it's not him, it's us. We're trying to do something that he didn't sanction. We're trying to have something based upon the flesh like sight and desire and all these other things of flesh not necessarily based upon truth we're trying to know what's best for the other guy and we do not we don't with the Holy Spirit we can be used for the sake of the other guy and at that moment you can know all things if, if, if God permits but we don't have the answer for the other guy Right? And what is that called when we constantly try to have the answer for the other guy? That's a type of pride. That, that's one saying, hey, you look to me, and I'll give you the right answer. Because I have labored to get this answer, therefore I'm worthy for you to hear it. Well, it's a bunch of hogwash. Because it was already written that God uses the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. Hmm? But he does. Here we go, chapter 2. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. 
They were all with one accord in one place. Jesus told them, don't depart out of Jerusalem. Here it comes. Don't depart out of Jerusalem. They obeyed. They stayed. They were together on one accord, praying and supplicating together in unity. Chapter 2, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as the rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues, like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues. That means other languages. Tongues means languages. And the Spirit, listen, they began to speak with other languages as the Spirit gave them utterance. Did they do it themselves? No. As the Spirit gave them utterance, so they spoke. Not as they spoke by themselves, not based upon their timing, but as the Spirit gave them utterance. Let's continue to read. And they were dwelling at Jerusalem, Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. Now how can that be? They were speaking in tongues or languages as the Spirit gave them utterance and they were speaking in everybody's native tongue and so it confounded quite a few people. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all of these which spake Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Now, you know what's amazing about this? In this time, just like in America, you can have people that speak American. But their native language could be something else. Because America is full of immigrants. Everybody in America is an immigrant, except for the Native Americans, right? Everybody else is an immigrant. Boy, that's it. You know, that just bothered some folks. Wait a minute. How can he say that? Because it's true. <clears throat> Native Americans are not immigrants. Everybody else is. Hmm? Black, white, Asian. Everybody else is a Native Amer is is a um, immigrant. But the Native Americans are not immigrants. <laughs> and if, how fast do we forget? At any rate, you can have a lot of people speaking the American language, right? But that may not be their native tongue. Now, this is why this is so significant. They were speaking with all those people out there with all their different native tongues. And based how it was back then, you could have a town over here that had a deviant of some other type language mixed with something else and they're saying wait a minute these are Galileans how in the world can they speak in my native tongue so these guys are speaking in different languages every man in their own language listen they said and how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born it didn't say some of them they said, how are we hearing every man up there speaking in our native language? Now, if you have a multitude of native languages, how can that come out of, how can that just, how can that even happen? To the logical mind, it can't, right? So then they describe it, Parthians and Medes and um, Elamites and dwellers in Mesopotamia and Judea. Right? Cappadocia and Pontus, Asia. Right? Gaia and, and, and uh, Pamphylia and Egypt. All these Libyans. All these languages spoken. And they're marveling. As the Spirit gave utterance. Cretes and Arabians. We do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. What were they speaking? In every native language. The wonderful works of God. Now, one of the miracles in this is they, that they would admit this. How could they admit this? How could they hear that so clearly? <clears throat> you, we can, you've heard pastors speak, right? This is so funny. You hear pastors speak, and somebody that just walks in is not going to say, oh, they're speaking the wonderful works of God, because a person will say, well, I don't understand, wouldn't they? 
right? That's not what these were saying. Not only did they speak in a different language, their native tongue, but they spoke in such clarity whatever they were speaking that the people comprehended it was the wonderful works of God. Clearly. See, that's the miracle. That's the miracle. Most people look at the miracle and saying, well, they spoke different languages. That's a miracle. No, the miracle was the words that they spoke pierced the people that were listening. Because they just admit it. How is it that we're hearing the wonderful works of God in our own native tongue? That's absolute understanding. They received utter and absolute understanding, just like that. And they were all amazed. Listen, and were in doubt, saying one to another, what does this mean? There's that rational mind kicking in. They were amazed. They understood they were speaking the wonderful works of God. They did not detest that. See, that gets me going right there. Not that they spoke in different languages. Right? That doesn't, that, okay. I can, that's, okay. But, that everybody understood in their native tongue, them speaking of the wonderful works of God. How did they identify with the Creator? How did they do that? How? What perfect sentence was given that they instantly know? Hmm? How many of you have ever had a dream and somebody called your name? How many have been somewhere and talking is all around but somebody calls your name and you turn around and look? Huh? How many of you have done that? You hear your name called out of a bunch of people and it's very subtle, could be faint. And you hear it and you say, wait a minute, did somebody call me? Right? Don't you do that? Don't you do that? <clears throat> out of all the people talking, out of all the noise that you hear, the voices and everything else, somebody utters your name and guess what you have? You have recognition. Here's the miracle. They were speaking the wonderful works of God and the people had recognition. What does this tell you? How could they understand that they were the wonderful works of God? Not just the works of God, but the wonderful works of God. How could they even know? See, when your name is called, you know that's your name. And that's why you say to someone, call my name. When somebody states a truth, they're already going to know it's absolute truth. And when it's spoken perfectly, by the Holy Spirit, there really is no denial. You'll know it. You'll say, ooh, how did that happen? How is this said? There's sometimes, you can have a conversation with a Holy Spirit person, person filled with the Holy Spirit. They'll say something, and you'll shudder. And you won't say a word, but you'll say, how in the world do they know what they know? And you'll try your best to get out of the way. You'll say, oh, no, nobody's supposed to know that. How did they just know that? They just said that thing, and you automatically recognize that as a truth in your life. And you don't want to admit it, because the first thing we do when that happens is we say, wait a minute, hmm, I wonder what that means. There, there's no possible way this person could know any of these things. Right? So you run the other direction. Listen, some of them, others mocking, said these men are full of new wine. They were all amazed, but look how the rational mind kicks in. You had the smart one saying, hmm, I wonder what this means. You have, the, you have the, those who mock, they instantly have an answer as to why it's happening. Now pay attention. Let's get rid of some of your life's frustrations. There is a, anywhere truth is present, a mocker is present. There will never be a truth where a mocker is not. A mocker's job in the spirit of mocking, right, is to find a reason why something is, a rational reason. The rational reason here is what they say, well, these guys are full of wine, right? The other ones who can be converted, what were they saying? Hmm? What does this mean? They wanted a deeper look. This means something. They were amazed, but they were in doubt. And they said, what does this mean? But the mockers instantly came to a conclusion. And what did they say? Huh? These men are full of new wine. Then Peter stands up and he says, but Peter, standing up with the eleven, 
lift it up. It, well, let me give you an example. If you ever watch Fox and CNN and all these guys, but, and I had to laugh one time at this. One time President Trump said, let me, let me see if I can get the words right. I might paraphrase a little bit. And, and they were discussing the wall, right? Right? It's when, they first, when he first stated something about the wall. Now, don't become emotionally compromised. I'm telling you something one time. Trump, and I had to laugh. Trump said, uh, he said, well, I'm going to build a wall. You know when he said he's going to build a wall and have Mexico pay for it. Well, this is when it just started. He said that, uh, you know, I'm going to build a wall and Mexico is going to pay for it. CNN gets on air and they said, well, Trump said, no matter the cost of the wall, right, that the Mexicans are going to pay for it. That's not what he said. You see, they just added that little piece in there. No matter the cost of the wall, Trump said he's going to pay for it. He can't do that. And they were trying to argue against him, right? I laughed so hard. I said, wait a minute. And then I kept hearing it. Trump would say something and somebody else would add 50 more words to it. And all of a sudden you have an argument over something. If, if nobody heard Trump, they would say, hey, yeah, Trump can't do that. But the problem was he didn't actually say what they were implying, right? It was funny. Oh, they did the same thing with, uh, with, with uh, all the other presidents, too. But with Trump, I mean, it was just something, something different about Trump. They just really said, no, no, we don't like this guy. Anyway, <clears throat> but mockers do the same thing. They all do the exact same thing. All right. They will come up with a plausible explanation so quick that people can instantly discount anything holy that's given. They have that luxury because they're allowed to operate maneuver in the earth right now, right? That's almost like if you work with a, uh, a person, they just came to Christ, and you're telling them about scriptures, not five minutes later, somebody will come up and say, ah, uh, don't listen to that stuff. That's what mockers and scoffers do. They will tell you. That spirit works anywhere there is truth. That spirit is at work. And they will say these exact words. Don't listen to them. Like they did Paul. Paul's deceiving you. Christ is deceiving you. That's what they said about Christ. He's deceiving you. That's, that's the number one word. Oh, it's deception. He's deceiving. That's the number one word of the accuser. Mocker. We've said that too, so let's not act like we didn't say it. We said that to each other, and only the Lord knows how many people we said are deceiving other folks because we didn't agree with what they were saying. Hmm? So let's not act like we didn't do it either. They were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What mean is this? Others mocking said, These men are full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as ye supposed, seeing is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Uh-oh. See, now we have to go to Joel. Joel, good old Joel. Can we go to Joel? This is that which is spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. What? Stop. Pause. Pause. Now, how many times have we gone through the book of Joel? How many times have you heard people go over the book of Joel? When he said, in the last days, he will pour out of his spirit on all flesh. Huh? This is telling you exactly what the Holy Spirit is. No need to argue another day. It's right here in Scripture. The nature of the Holy Spirit is bound to be given. The truth, which is so simple. Right? The book of Joel is about the end times, isn't it? Huh? Isn't it? Starting at Joel chapter 228, listen, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy. This is Joel chapter 2, starting at verse 28. Hmm? Verse 2, starting at 28. And it shall come to pass afterward. Folks, you're going to follow me on this. Because I, you guys always hear me say you're in the middle of something. Something is not beginning. You're in the middle of something. Now, you, you follow me on this. Because we probably won't get any further than this one statement, but I'm going there. Can I go there? 
Listen, Joel chapter 2, 28 starts and it begins and it says this, and it shall come to pass afterward. But after what? Well, let's go find out, shall we? Shall we? Listen. You guys ready? Blow ye the trumpet in Zion and sound the alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh for his night hand. A day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness as a morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong there hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years and many generations. A fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness, yea, nothing shall escape them. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses, and as horsemen so shall they run. Like the noise of chariots atop mountains shall they leap, like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble, a strong people set in battle array. Before their face the people shall be much pained, all faces shall gather blackness, they shall run like mighty men, they shall climb the wall like men of war, they shall march every one on his, uh, in his ways, and they shall not break the ranks. Neither shall one thrust another, they shall walk every man in his path. And when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. They shall run to and fro in the city, they shall run upon the wall, they shall climb upon the houses. They shall enter into the windows like a thief. The earth shall quake before them, the heavens shall tremble, the sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars which are all the shining. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great. For he is strong that executeth this word. For the day of the Lord's great for the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide in it? Therefore, here we go, therefore also now saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart, with fasting and with weeping and with mourning. Now listen what happened. Joel chapter two, one through two eleven is telling you something coming. Starting in verse twelve it says, Therefore also now, because of this saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your heart, not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil, who knoweth if he will return and repent, and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God. The Lord knows your intentions of everything that you do. Blow the trumpet and shine, sanctify fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and those that suck the breasts. Let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar, and let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord, and give give not thine heritage to reproach, that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, Where is their God? Then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. Yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil, and ye shall be satisfied therewith, and I will no more make your reproach among the heathen. I will remove far off from you the northern army, and will drive him into a land barren and desolate, with his face towards the east sea, and his hinder part towards the uttermost sea. And his stink shall come up, and his ill savor shall come up, because he hath done great things. This is all to, also described in earlier parts of the Bible, and also later, as to who this uh, is precisely. Fear not, O land. Be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. Be not afraid, ye beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring, for the tree beareth her fruit, the fig tree, and the vine do yield their strength. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord. For he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. And the floors shall be full of wheat, and the fats shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm, the caterpillar, the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. Uh oh, you mean that great army he was just talking about that they wouldn't break their ranks? Are the canker worm, the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, who, by the way, are very special types of insects. They really are. Because all of them have something in common, and they're doing what they do now. And I'm telling you that now. And you shall eat, this is Joel 2.26, and you shall eat plenty and be satisfied. Praise the name of the Lord your God. 
that hath dealt wondrously with you. And mine people shall never be ashamed. And you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and none else. And my people shall never be ashamed. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. Stop. Now, we were just reading in Acts where it says, in Acts 2.17. Well, let's start at 15. When Peter says, these are not drunken as ye suppose, seeing it is about the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last day, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall dream dreams. Now, this should make you scratch your head. It really should make you scratch your head. Because clearly it says afterward, after what? And it shall come to pass afterward. Right? Afterward. He'll pour his spirit out on all flesh. So what is he talking about starting in Joel 2.18? What is he talking about? When he says, then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. How many are confused right now? You're sitting there seeing it in scripture, but you're confused. Honestly, go ahead and say yes. The average individual would say, wait a minute, something is not fitting here. But clearly, Peter's just said that was fulfillment of prophecy. But I've been taught all this comes after in the, you know, in the last days, in the latter times. Well, see, that's the key. That is the key. We are talking about the last days. Afterward. Right? After things have... You know what we do? Let me tell you what we do. First of all, if nothing happens in our generation, we discount the rest of the stuff that happened. Do you know how much blood has been shed in every single nation on the face of this earth? Do you know how many people died to get to the point where we are right now? Do you really? Do you, do you know how many races have been enslaved? Do you remember the impoverished time of Japan? The desperation of Asia? We're talking about in fairly modern times. The slaughtering of people in the Middle East and in Europe. Russia's own internal turmoil. People basically living in the land but being prisoners of their own nation. Now, if you could step back and take time out of the way, the only thing you would say is this. A great evil has come upon the face of the earth, and countless numbers of my brethren have died. And war and fighting and vengeance is perpetual. And of all the restored places, there have been seasons of a type of peace. Israel... Its process happened after the world had been against it until 1963 when they recaptured Jerusalem. And they had skirmishes and policy issues, but guess what? They've also been highly prosperous. God restored to that place the corn and the wine, didn't he? Didn't he? Hmm? Now, on the day of the Lord, you're going to find something else as we go through the book of Acts. Everything God does is foreshadowed by smaller events, kind of like sprinkles in a storm, right? You can have a strong wind, you can have lightning, you can even see a twister, but that may not be the main body of the storm. Those are signs of the storm. Hmm? Signs of a storm. There may be damaging hail. Those are signs of a storm. Signs. So what is our marker? This is our marker. That the Lord will pour out of his spirit upon all flesh. Joel 2.28 
And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Why? Because God is pouring out of whose spirit? His spirit. And also upon the servants and the handmaidens in those days will I pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke, and the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and the terrible day of the Lord come. Pause. This is what confuses folks. People have forgotten something that after the Holy Ghost was given to the apostles, there was a terrible destruction in Jerusalem. They forget in the 1200s where for three years there was darkness seen upon the face of the earth. They vandalized the trees and the tree rings going back some many years. Terrible things have happened on this earth since Christ. And people are not aware of it. Most people are not aware that twice, once in the, um, in the 1200s and the 1400s, that darkness was seen over the majority of the earth, the vegetation in the trees, the sun was blotted out, growth slowed, many things died. You can tell that by the rings on the trees. You can see how much oxygen was in the atmosphere. Something horrific happened. And they're covering it all up. You know why? Because if you were ever to discover the truth, it would add faith to your faith, but it would also break down the religious order of this world. Now, you can have war, you can have man against man and child against mother and so on and so forth, but when you start to fracture faith, now you have an upheaval. Of all things... That are done on this earth, faith always continues, and they know that, because the day it no longer continues, you have a very bad soup of hopelessness. And when people become hopeless and they believe that they're doing everything that they're doing in vain, those who don't really have a real religion, who have no spirit to carry them forward, they'll begin to kill their fellow man. All of their discipline, patience, and waiting were turned to murder and violence. And what are they doing now? They're attempting to destroy the faith. Even Satan himself is not dumb enough to do that. Which is why the son of perdition, that man of perdition, he takes the place of God, of anything called God, but they still have a faith in him. Right now, faith and things of old are being shifted into this new scientific and political paradigm. Faith is imperative for the survival of a human being. They must have something to believe in, and through these behavioral scientists, they know this. There is no way in the world they're going to uncover certain things, because to prove one religion right is to disprove the rest. And if that takes place... You can imagine the desperation that will be upon the face of the earth. Desperation of the soul is worse than starvation. So what are we reading here in Joel? At first we read what will happen in the last days. Then we saw the process of Israel and Jerusalem itself. Then we see God pouring out of his spirit upon all flesh. And then we see the great and notable day of the Lord come after that takes place in the last days. Now, key note here. And it shall come to pass afterward, it says, the Lord says, I will pour, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. In the book of Acts, it says, and it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Why the emphasis on that from someone speaking of the Holy Spirit? Because it is in the last days of which the, Holy, the power of the Holy Spirit was given for the gospel of Jesus Christ. When Revelation said the time is at hand, that's exactly what it meant. You were born into the last days, which is why it's very difficult to recognize 
some of the hardship and the pressures that you feel in the world is because you were born in the last days. If you were ever born in a prison and all you knew was that prison and the community, you would never ever call it a prison. You would call it home. Because you were born in the last days, you cannot recognize the absolute timing. Because you're also born in a man-made and devil-made delusion full of laws and regulations. They surplant dreams into your heads. And now people's ambitions becomes what they have programmed you to have. Just like a person, if they want to be rich, who planted that in their brains? Not our father, so it didn't come from a source of truth. It came from a source of vanity. So you've been predisposed to desire those things within the limits of the jail. But the truth is, we were born into a prison. That's the truth. And who would love the prison? But the devoted prisoner. Well, I got news for you. I'm not a devoted prisoner. But if you were ever born in a prison, that's all you knew. It would not be a prison. It would be home. You would never use that word. Somebody could come in there from the outside and say, Hey, you all are bound, locked up, and you're in prison. And you would say, Get out of here. You're full of lies. You don't know what you're talking about. And you would be behind bars. And you would tell the person that's not behind bars, they don't know what they're talking about. You would have no context for that prison. See, when you're born in something, you have no context for it. The truth is, we are born into a prison. There's only one way to escape it. One way to be free from it is to have your eyes opened. Even that term, to have your eyes open, is to see the truth. To sleep is to not see the truth. And if you don't see the truth, well, you believe what is before you which is misrepresented because you don't have the whole scope. Your perspective is wrong. You're looking from the inside out, but you can't see totally out. All you know is what's on the inside. You don't know what's on the outside. That's why it's a chasm between spirituality and what people call reality. And there have always been things to get our attention, to say, hey, wake up. Things are not what you think. Hmm? who does all those things for the believer our father does it's part of the calling can you imagine if you were born into a large prison and you didn't know anything else and you heard a voice coming outside of the walls calling your name but nobody else did just you or you felt a yearning to look outside the confines of which you didn't call confines you can explain that to anybody eventually you might answer Eventually, you grow up, you make a choice. And if you answer that calling, you may find yourself free. If you follow the instructions on how to get out of it, and do you not know Jesus gave us the instructions to break free of all things of this world? All things, not some things. And it's by the power of the Holy Spirit that that can be done and that you can demonstrate for others because naturally they don't believe it. The truth is this. Why give the power of the Holy Spirit if you don't need it. Think about it. Why would the power of the Holy Spirit be given in the first place? Why would the power be given in the first place if it were not needed? Our God is not vain. He didn't do anything for an empty reason. He didn't do anything like that. Because you're fighting some uh, natural instincts not to believe. And for those who are found who find themselves following Christ, I'll say, who begin to commune with him, who begin to work on one accord in the spiritual things, in the truth. You see, they worked on one accord based on truth, the truth of Christ. That was their point of meeting, not their individual personalities. They came together by way of Christ and his words, not their own. That's how they came together. Because there are often times they disagreed with each other. You're also going to see that in the book of Acts. And you may not have ever seen it before, but they disagreed with each other, but they came together in Christ, and they realized something later on, that they're always growing. 
Hence, they knew when the race was finished. But they came together in one accord in Christ. And as promised the Holy Spirit, by form of cloven tongues settled on all of them. And that was the power because Jesus specifically said, But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. The Holy Ghost is God's Spirit, my goodness. It is, it, it, listen, the, God says, I will pour out my Spirit. It is His Spirit. God is Spirit. Therefore, we must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Listen to me. He said, I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. Not some flesh, all flesh. Now listen. He's going to pour out his spirit. Now, God is spirit, but to partake of the power of his spirit, the truth of his spirit, means you no longer have an excuse to deny God in the first place. Therefore, if you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, there's no forgiveness for it. Because if you disrespect, disregard, or anything else, after you have felt God's Spirit, you have no more excuses. You've been shown everything that God is absolute and God is real. Prior to receiving the Holy Spirit, you have not been shown everything. When you receive the power of the Holy Spirit, secrets are revealed to you. The deep things of the Father are proof. And once you have proof, well, you could just well be in trouble. Because if you have proof from the Father, you can't walk that back. Because if you deny it, you have truly denied it. One time I said, you better thank God. He didn't give you the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit prematurely. Because you would have condemned your own selves. Not being mature enough to handle it. Notice they had to follow some instruction before receiving the power of the Holy Spirit, didn't they? They had to go through a time of persecution with Christ before they even housed the power of the Holy Spirit. They had to be anchored in the truth because they were ever so shaky. You see, when it looked like the word failed, that was the time they took him to be killed. They all got shaky. You don't believe me? Didn't Peter deny him? Yes, he did. When it look and that is the word failing in our lives when we think the words of Christ are not working, that's that evening when they took Jesus. And what did we do? We went berserko. We denied him. We betrayed him. Why? Because something went the opposite direction in which we were looking. We thought the words of Christ were going to come through for us all the way, and we did not ever, ever think that that thing of Christ would be persecuted. So then we've all occupied that night. Because when it looks like the word is killed in your life, that's when you start doing weird things, don't you? There's not a process you're going to read in the New Testament that you have not gone through. Have you ever been in a situation after you had prayed and you prayed and you prayed and the answer did not come and it felt like that the word somehow betrayed you and you became desperate and nervous, totally shaken of the flesh, ready to jump, jump to another deliverer somewhere else? Huh? That's just like that night when Jesus was taken away. Do you really think they, they, they were beside themselves when that happened, just like you were beside yourself when the trauma came and no one rescued you? When no rescue came, some of us doubted, some of us denied, some of us betrayed. Well, I just won't believe anymore. And you went out there in the world and drank again and did whatever again. Because that was your moment. That was your moment. That was the time when you thought the word was not working on your behalf. And you became angry. In some cases, you were scared to be associated that you were believed. Somebody told you, well, I told you not to believe in those foolish things. Didn't they tell you that? And what did you do? That's when you denied him. 
Well, I really, you know, that's just the way it is, and you try to change the subject and go on. But they emphasized, why did you believe in that nonsense in the first place? Isn't that, is that true or false, folks? Hmm? Is that true or false? Because isn't that the same spirit that came in the time of Christ? And you've spoken to the same spirits. You think they stopped back then? No, they didn't. Because they asked Peter, don't you, aren't you the ones, aren't you affiliated? Oh, no, I don't know him. Same way we did. Why did you believe in that silliness? Ah, you know, I was just, uh, anyway, what movie is playing? You, you denied him. Why? Because a failure came. What you call a failure came, but it wasn't really a failure. I want to point that out because often we look at timing of fulfilled prophecy in our own way, not necessarily the Lord's way, by revelation. It's imperative that we begin to do things by revelation. The Bible already told us that their, 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 a, a child will lead them, children will lead us. That means those, a child must operate not by knowledge but by revelation. You know that? The wise can operate by knowledge that they have obtained, but a child must be given revelation. And a child shall lead them. Uh-oh. The child has not amassed that much knowledge. So if they lead, they must lead by way of revelation and lead by way of truth. Hmm? Us old ones, through knowledge, multitude of troubles, right? Tons of gray hairs and everything else. Trial and error. We've learned to listen. That's what wisdom is. My personal definition of wisdom is the ability to apply knowledge. Wisdom from above is what I'm after. The ability to apply the word, which can only be given by way of the Holy Spirit. But we're going to challenge things. This is an introduction, right? I know you're scratching your head about Joel 2 now. Some of you are going to go back and read Joel 2 and then read Acts 2 and say, wait a minute. Wait, i got to make sense of this. Wait a minute. It makes perfect sense. It makes absolute perfect sense. But it goes a lot deeper. And this really is an introduction into the setting of the book of Acts so that we can understand something. Because the granting of the Holy Spirit came after an instruction was given. And they could not listen because they were told to do something after the Holy Spirit came in a fullness to all the world. Right? They went out in little places before this time. Before the Holy Spirit came upon them, they were followers of Christ. After the Holy Spirit came, they were ambassadors to Christ. In full authority. Going where they were sent. Not going in their own directions. They no longer had a personal life. They didn't. They began to live for the kingdom and the kingdom alone. They had to have upsets in their walk. Peter had to deny Christ. He had to be broken of his own pride because he's the one that bragged. I'll never deny you. Don't we say things like, I'll never deny the Lord. And because Peter bragged, he was tested by that to let him know, Peter, you don't have the power within yourself. You may have the desire, but you don't have the power So the Holy Spirit is God's spirit. God's spirit. Pouring out on all flesh. All flesh. Not some flesh. All flesh. And we're going to find some disconnects and some corrections. Not based on my words, but based just like the Joel. Just like Joel. The first part of Joel, again, is describing the day of the Lord. The second part is describing a long process. The third part of Joel is this promise we're reading of.
All in chapter 2. The first is the end of the matter. That is the day, the warning. The second is the process leading up to the warning. That's why it said these things are going to happen. Therefore, you better do so and so. You better do this and God will do this. And he says, and it shall come to pass afterward. After what? After the process has began. That the spirit will be poured out on all flesh. Surely it happened to. But the second, the process happens all the way up into the end time. And then, at the time the Holy Spirit was given unto mankind, it was written that I will show wonders in heaven, saith the Lord, and in the earth blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood. Key word, moon into blood. Before the great and the terrible day of the Lord come. Before the great and the terrible day of the Lord come. The sun is going to be turned into darkness before the day of the Lord comes. The moon is going to be turned into blood before, before the great and the terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass, listen, this is a dead giveaway. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. That's the exact message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the catalyst. It is Psalm 107 again. Jesus came that we may call on that name. See, before this, there was no name. How could you call upon the name of the Lord without a name? Think about it. So then that's why they messed up the prophecies. That's why the Pharisees didn't know the prophecies. You're going to find that out too. There are key words in there that a cave man could pick up and read and say, wow, that's it. We were given one name to call upon weren't we you don't know God's name he's unnameable in order for anybody to give God a name they must be over him there's no one over God so forget that he is that he is but we were given a name we were given a name didn't we just read in John chapter 5 huh? that God has granted the son all the authorities and all judgment. Didn't we just read that? All judgment, all authority is given to the Son. And he's the one that quickens whomever he wants. And he is a high priest who is very sensitive and sympathetic to what bothers us every single day of the week. My goodness. We have a brother and we have a high priest and we have a savior and we were given a name and it's his authority that all must bow to every tongue must confess to it is before him that people will stand that's why it was written pray that you escape all these things and be worthy to stand before the son of man because listen to be worthy to stand before the son of man means you have overcome all things. And if you have overcome all things, you need not go through them. Because a person who has overcome, overcome all things and goes through them is immune to them. I know that for a fact. You think your situation has gotten better? No, it hasn't. You've become immune to him. Why? Because you've overcome them. When you overcome something, that thing no longer bothers you. It no longer moves you. To be worthy to stand before the Son of Man is to be in a complete compliance with Him, with Christ. Otherwise, your life is going to be forged and tried. You're going to be purged. The more stubborn we are, the greater the purging, the hotter the flames. And then one day, we'll say, Lord Jesus, I bow before you. And I tear my own life before you and cast it away. My life is truly no longer my own. My desires are the kingdom of God. And you are my Savior and you are my Lord. And you will stop living your own life. 
He knows it's difficult. But he overcame that through him we too may overcome. That's why he said, follow me. A lot of people may say they have answered the call. But the truth is they heard him but began to do what they think they should do. Not necessarily responding to the call of Christ. To respond to the call of Christ is to walk away from your life. He did not call your life. He called you. So when you respond, you also begin to cast away. You'll stand before him. Nothing of you is going to stand before him. Just you. You, the living soul. You will. Folks, I'm going to say God bless you. i got to go. We will likely continue part. No, no, I take that back. Tomorrow, now Sunday, we're going into our study of being free. Being free. That's where I really tell myself, okay? Tomorrow, I, I know you're going to hear, you're going to hear massive language about Nibiru. I already know you are. I know you are. So we're going to go over a few things tomorrow. Okay, I, it's just going to be a flood of information about binary systems and the Biru uh, because of the proof, I guess you could say. Right? Mayor, you set up the time tomorrow for, the, uh, for, our, for our call for the science team. And I'll accommodate you guys in that, okay? Just set up the call, set up the time, make sure I knew it. And um, make sure Angela knows it too. Okay? Probably afternoon would be the best. That'd be the best. Okay. Um, but we know the rhetoric is going to fly. Folks, don't forget your country. Try not to look up on mankind as, as, as um, certain things. I mean, tomorrow could be a pretty deep subject, but I want to stay planted in some of these wholesome things. Because what good would it be to know all of what is coming and not be spiritually prepared for it. What good would it be to know that something is coming to an end and then we are going to be condemned at the end of it? That wouldn't be good. We need to be prepared and prepared in truth by the words of our Lord. We prepared enough by way of mankind and look where we are. Hmm? This is what we get for listening. To men, and you know the word says, cease ye from man whose breath is in his nostrils. Stop following mankind is what the word says, whose breath is in his nostrils. We can have revelation because the Lord said so. We can be complete and overcome all things because the Lord said so. Now we need understanding from above. All right? Good, wholesome understanding. Tomorrow I'm going to talk about because I know you're going to be bombarded about things from Nibiru. Right? NASA's new funding, and this, that, and the other, which some people don't want that. Honestly, they don't. Um, it's not so much the action of it, but the statement and the allocation of funds. But then civilians are going to begin to see something, and I know that Nibiru topic is going to pop up. And the conditions of earth will somewhat accommodate the argument. And so we'll talk about some things. You will hear that word binary system. You'll hear many people switching over to that somehow. And some, of course, some people will make up stories, but it's all, it's, it's really all coming this time. It really is. Folks, I want to say God bless each of you. I'm going to join everybody tomorrow, likely around 3 p.m. So we must have a meeting before that, Mayor, before 3 p.m., okay? Three, well, sometimes Saturdays, three. If I'm not there at three, it'll be six. But we'll try to update you guys, okay? The system will be going, uh, where's Larry Bond at? Is he around? Is he around? No? Okay, here's what we have to do. If he pops on, you guys know how to get to his mixler. But we've got to um, uh, switch some things around, do some work. Um, and get some uploads uh, started here. So 
Bear with us as we do that. I will join all of you are likely tomorrow around 3. Now, Angela and myself will be on Sunday. So that's where we'll be. I want to say God bless everybody. And God bless you mindly. Thank you for joining me tonight. And thank you for being family tonight. God bless.